Hello and welcome to our next major area of study as we delve into organic chemistry. In today's lesson, we're going to introduce the fundamentals of organic chemistry by looking at organic formulas and introducing nomenclature. Where our lesson objective, we're going to identify characteristic organic functional groups and understand the naming and drawing conventions for organic molecules. Now, organic chemistry is a very, very fascinating area of study. And in fact, it's my favorite area of study uh, between the three that we've looked at in this course. But it can be very daunting to start off with because there are lots and lots of sort of rules, essentially, you have to be familiar with. But then once you are familiar and you're comfortable with using these rules, it becomes very, very easy to apply these to all sorts of different contexts. So to use the trite old cliche of learning to ride a bike, it has a very steep learning curve but then once you're on that bike and you can ride that bike, it becomes very easy to apply everything. So just keep that in mind as we introduce everything today because this will all look very new and uh, unfamiliar, but we will be spending a lot of time consolidating and going over these con concepts. So organic chemistry predominantly focuses on covalently bonded carbon molecules. It looks at the structure, properties, and reactions of organic compounds. Now carbon is a very fascinating and I suppose unique in many ways, uh, a unique atom due to the millions and millions of different ways that you can make structures with it. It's got uh, four covalent bonds that it can make and it can form long chains, it can form rings, it can form all these different kinds of structures that has just a limitless, essentially I suppose, um, ways of putting these together. So. We call it organic chemistry because it's based off the idea that all living things are organic things and they all are carbon-based organisms. They have carbon as the fundamental makeup, uh, I suppose, of their being. Um, and this is uh, historically where we get the name organic chemistry from, compared that to inorganic chemistry, which is, you know, the chemistry of non-living things. But we've now, that has developed, and we've now got synthetic organic chemistry where we can replicate in the lab, so we can replicate and manipulate organic reactions um, similar to how I suppose a biological system would, but we are doing it synthetically, man-made, just through our knowledge. And for a long time that was thought to be an unattainable thing to do, but we now live in a reality where we do that every day. <laughs> So why, why is carbon so unique and why is carbon the base of this? It's all to do with its ability to form chains in millions of different combinations so it can catenate. This is a word that just means form, forming chains essentially. And this can allow for a great complexity and variety of organic organisms. Um, there are also lots of features by other non-metals. Uh, commonly, we'll see lots of hydrogens, nitrogens, oxygens. We will see our halogens in there, you know, things like phosphorus, sulfur occasionally pop up. Um, but it's all organic covalently bonded molecules, so it's all mostly to do with our non-metals on the right-hand side of our periodic table there. Um, and just one thing to be aware of is that some carbon compounds, despite having carbon, are, are classified as inorganic substances, um, such as oxides of carbons that we've uh, looked at briefly before, perhaps. Um, carbon anion salts, these are inorganic compounds despite having carbon. So, a little brief intro into what organic chemistry means. So, lots of information is going to be introduced today. Like I said just before, we are going to practice and consolidate and go over this again and again. So it'll all seem very unfamiliar now, but hopefully sooner rather than later, it will start to click in place and we will be on that metaphorical bike. First thing we've got to introduce are organic formulas. These are ways that we can represent organic molecules. And there's a number of these, some we're familiar with, some we are unfamiliar with. For example, you've got molecular and empirical formulas, you've got skeletal formulas, you've got three-dimensional ball and stick models. These are all showing different bits of information and it's that sort of trade-up with how much information do you want to show, how much time do you want to spend drawing the structure. Some of these organic molecules can be massive. Um, so if you're doing a structure that shows every little conceivable bit of information, that's not a practical thing to do. So there's certain short, well not shortcuts, but there's certain methods, I suppose, that have been developed to, you know, uh, juggle between how easy it is to do and how much information it can show. Different circumstances, we're going to be using different formulas for that. So these are the organic formulas we're going to introduce. And then nomenclature is essentially just a naming system. You can think of organic chemistry as having a language, and we've got to learn that language. 
And like learning any language, there's fundamental rules that underpin how it is structured. And when you learn those rules, then you can apply those rules to any situation. But also like learning a language, I mean, it's not the most simple thing in the world just to learn a language. You've got to practice, you've got to go over, you've got to use it. And that's what we'll be doing. We're going to introduce the fundamental rules for our organic chemistry language today. And then these are going to underpin everything that we look at throughout the organic chemistry topic. So it's the rules for naming molecules based on the number of carbons and functional groups present. The thing to keep in mind through all of this as we introduce all our different functional groups, all our aldehydes, our ketones, all of our carboxylic acids and esters, all of our different varying organic molecules, it all just comes down to carbon and I suppose hydrogen as well. Carbon is the key to the organic chemistry and the fact that it can make so many millions and millions of different combinations due to its uh, ability to form chains makes it a very special thing to look at. But let's begin by looking at some of these different formulas. Here are two that you are already familiar with, the molecular formula and the empirical formula. The molecular formula simply shows us the exact number of atoms that are present in a molecule. The empirical formula is the molecular formula in the simplest ratio. Sometimes the molecular formula and the empirical formula can be the same. Um, now here are some others that you might have seen, but you might not be explicitly familiar with what their name is. We've got the structural formula, which shows unambiguously which atoms are bonded to each other in the minimum amount of detail. We've got the displayed formula that shows through a drawing every bond between atoms and their relative placing between them. And then we have our skeletal formula, which is a simplified version of the displayed formula with the symbols for carbon atoms, hydrogen atoms, and carbon-hydrogen bonds removed. So all our organic molecules have a carbon-hydrogen skeleton. So we can simplify that with some, I guess, tricks, for lack of a better word, uh, that we'll look at in just a moment to make these formulas, especially when they become very large and you're drawing lots of them to make them a little bit easier to do. So it's all about how much information you want to show and it's all about how much time you want to spend showing that information. Let's look at some examples. Here is butuanine. Now we'll look at these naming conventions in a moment, but for now I'll just tell you that it's C4H8. That is the molecular formula that has exactly four carbons and exactly eight hydrogens. We could do an empirical formula where we get that in the simplest ratio, divide both of those numbers by four to get CH2 as an empirical formula. We've looked at these in previous lessons earlier on in the physical chemistry. Now a structural formula shows which atoms are bonded to each other in the minimum amount of detail. So it's showing us that the carbon has a double bond with the carbon over here, and we got the hydrogens bonded to these carbons. Then we have the displayed formula, which is a drawing that shows all of the bonds between the atoms. So you can already see that whilst you might be able to infer more information from this, this is obviously going to take you longer to draw than this. This is going to take you longer to draw than just that. It's all about how much information and for what purpose you want to communicate that information to, or through maybe. And then we have our skeletal formulas, which is an even more simplified version. It's simplifying this carbon-hydrogen backbone of all organic molecules to a skeleton, essentially. So how do we interpret these? Organic molecules often contain long hydrocarbon chains, and we can't spend all this time writing out each and every one of these carbon hydrogen bonds. But we're at this point now where we've got a good amount of knowledge under our belt and we can start to assume certain information to make uh, our lives a little bit easier. And this is one of those cases where we are at a point where we can make it easier for ourselves because we're assuming that we have this knowledge already. And it's all to do with the fact that we know that carbon makes four bonds and the fact that hydrogen will always make one bond. So it doesn't use the symbols for carbons or hydrogens bonded to carbons, only with the other atoms. It makes it quick and easy to draw complex molecules. The lines represent the carbon-carbon bonds, where the vertex is where a carbon would be. So this has one, two, three, four carbons. So each vertex is representing a carbon. And then we can use our understanding of chemistry, the fact that we know that carbon always makes four bonds, to fill in any hydrogens based on any bonds that it needs to make to have that full four bonds. So for example here, this carbon has two bonds to that carbon, so we know that this is going to have two hydrogens there. This carbon is bonded to, two carb uh, bonded to a carbon there through a double bond, bonded to a carbon there through a single bond, so we know it's only going to have one hydrogen to make that four bonds. Again, we're using our information to make our lives a little bit easier. So the hydrogens are hidden, but they are implied. It doesn't mean they're not there, 
it just means we're implying them because we can just, you know, add up to four. Because <laughs> that's all carbon's gonna make. Any bonds to make four, the rest will be made up by the hydrogens. And then we do a zigzag to represent the hybridization of carbon. So these skeletal formulas are very useful because we can start to very quickly and very easily draw large organic molecules where if we were drawing out every single atom, we would be spending a long time doing that. Whereas we can just use our vertices and our rules that say that all of the vertices, so all the points are carbons, and we can just infer the hydrogens based on it's always gonna make four bonds. So that has two bonds, so that means there'll be two hidden hydrogens there. This one has three bonds, so there'll be one hidden hydrogen there, so on and so forth. And then we can just show the interesting part, well not the interesting part, but the parts that you know do all the chemistry more or less, the uh, functional groups with the atoms that are present for those functional groups. So five kinds of organic formulas, two of which we are familiar with already, and then structural formula, display formula, skeletal formula, just showing the same thing with differing amounts of detail. Now make sure to learn each of these by name because if you're doing an exam question, it will specify what well, may specify, um, you know, draw a displayed formula or draw a structural formula. And if you draw the right thing, but with the wrong formula, you can lose the marks, which you know, would be a frustrating thing to do because you haven't drawn it wrong, you just haven't drawn what they've asked. So then the other main thing we've got to look at is this idea of functional groups. The functional groups are what give the organic molecules their flavor if you could think of it like that. It's the, uh, these are the parts that are doing all the magic, doing all the chemical reactions and have all the chemical properties of our organic molecules. So there's certain combinations of atoms or just single atoms they can be, or they can be a group of atoms that have specific chemical properties and undergo characteristic reactions irrespective of its size. We call these functional groups and we can categorize these into things that are called homologous series. So homo, the ancient Greek, meaning the same. So the functional groups are part of the series that's the same, essentially. They're all part of the same group. Organic molecules can be classified into groups depending on what functional groups they contain. They are called homologous series. So irrespective of how big the size is, if we have characteristic functional groups, we could predict and we could observe characteristic chemical reactions and, you know, behavior that these types of molecules will demonstrate. We need to be familiar with these. So this is what I was saying when it's somewhat like a language. We've got to learn these rules and it can be difficult to learn all these rules, but once we've learned these rules, then we just very simply, or not very simply, we just apply them to the situation that we're in. So our simplest ones are our alkenes and our alkanes. So we've got our alkanes, which all just contain carbon, carbon, single bonds. So just carbon bonded to single bonds, and then our hydrogens filling those in. They're the simplest kind of organic molecules. Then we have our alkenes, which are a bit more complicated. They contain a carbon, carbon double bond somewhere in the molecule. Uh, make sure that all my bonds are correct. And then we have, you know, R, a lot of the time in organic chemistry, we designate R to just mean rest of the molecule. Alkanes and alkenes, single bond and a double bond. And then we've even got these things that we're not gonna look at too much, but might as well bring it up, called an alkyne. You might be able to guess based on a little trend here what an alkyne is. We have a triple bond in our alkyne. Can't have um, four bonds. It's just impossible for the electrons to reach around and you know make four bonds with just two atoms. So the alkynes is as far as it goes there. Then we have our halogenoalkanes. Halogenoalkanes, you might be able to predict, predict what a halogeno, halo, oh, I wanna make sure I spell this right, halogenoalkane is an alkane that has a halogen. So I'm gonna de designate my halogen with X, um, but it could be you know, a chlorine, a bromine, an iodine, some sort of halogen. We have our alcohols, carbonyls, carboxylic acids, and esters. So let's look at these. Alcohols, first of all. There's primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohols, but we'll look at that uh, later on in detail when we look at alcohols individually. So we're gonna have lessons on each of these individually. We're gonna become very familiar with them. Like I said, I'm just introducing it all right now to be aware of. An alcohol is that group. 
and hydro uh, a hydroxyl group, an oxygen bonded to a hydrogen, and then we have the rest of our molecule, our, our carbon chain. So an OH group is the alcohol. Then we have our carbonyls, which I might pop these ones. I'll do them separately. So we got our aldehydes. These ones are similar. Aldehydes and our ketones. These contain a C double bond O like that. Our aldehyde has a C double bond O at the end of the molecule. So we have the rest of the molecule going out that way. Whereas our ketone has a C double bond O within the molecule. So we've got two carbon chains on both sides there. Then we got our carboxylic acids, which are a bit similar. Again, how am I going for Rome? Acids. So our carboxylic acids have a carbonyl group. So they got the double bond O, and they also have a hydroxyl group, thus carboxylic, uh, carbonyl, hydroxyl, carboxyl, <laughs> carboxylic, uh, which looks like that. We've got our carboxylic acid. We have our esters, our amines, and our nitriles. Let me make a little bit more room over on the other side here. So carboxylic acids, now let's look at our esters got our esters, which are similar to our carboxylic acids, only instead of having this group at the end of the carbon chain, we have the group within the carbon chain. So we have a double bond O, O, and then we got the rest of the molecule like that. So similar. So you can see there's a lot of overlap here, um, but they do all have you know, different chemical properties, so we can put them all in these different organic uh, homologous series based on these functional groups. Then we've got our nitrogen functional groups. We've got our amines. Again, you can have uh, primary, secondary, tertiary, depending on where it is in the molecule. We're not gonna look at that too much now, but just it's got a carbon molecule, rest of the molecule with a nitrogen, and then depending on how many carbons it's bonded to. So it's just the nitrogen bonded to the carbon. And then we got our things called nitriles, which is a C triple bonded with an N and then the rest of our molecule like that. So there's a lot to have to learn here, but like I just said, we are going to spend lessons on each of these functional groups individually. So I'm just introducing it all, I'm not expecting you to know it all at this point, but just being aware of the learning curve, like I said at the start of the video, the, the steep learning curve that we have to we have to climb, you know, we've got to fall off the bike a bunch of times before we can stay on the bike, to go back to that bike riding metaphor. So yeah, these are all the different functional groups that are giving our molecule its particular flavor. Molecules can have a number of functional groups, so there can also be a whole bunch of these different combinations within the molecule as well. It's not just they've always got one, they've always got that one. They can have different combos in there as well. Uh, and we've got a list of rules for naming organic molecules depending on their size and the functional groups they contain. Let us have a look at that now. Let's learn the fundamentals, the nomenclature. So that's just a fancy science word for naming. Let's learn the rules so that we can speak organic chemistry more or less. So our organic nomenclature, like I said earlier, is the language of organic chemistry. And it's just based off of a few rules. Now, when scientists all over the world were doing the same chemistry, they needed to make sure that they were all communicating with the same language. So this IUPAC, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, came up with the language of chemistry to make sure that chemists all over the world us, you know, can understand one another and they're, they're all on the same uh, playing field. They're all playing the same game, more or less. Um, so these are the rules to name molecules that depend on their size and their functional groups that they contain. We're going to start off simply, which where else would you start but with the simple part. So we're going to look at simple molecules that just have one functional group and it can be named on two parts. Like we've said, a organic molecule has a carbon chain and an organic molecule has a functional group or a simple organic molecule. So the name's in two parts. The first part of the name tells you how many carbons in the chain. Second part of the name tells you what functional group is in the molecule. So the prefix tells us the number of carbons, the suffix tells us the functional groups, and our alkanes provide the basis of 
the prefix. <coughs> so it looks like this. We've got a number of carbon atoms going down here and we'll look at the prefix on this side. The first four are a bit different, but then after that, it all just becomes the same as your shapes, you know, if you're thinking about how many sides in a shape. So let's just dive in. If we've got one carbon, that has a meth. So a one carbon alkane would be methane. Two carbons is a, uh, eth, so ethane. Three carbons pro, propane. Four carbons but is butane. After this, the number of carbons is just the same as if you think about shapes. Pent, hex, hept, oct, non, dec, etc., etc. It's just the first four that are maybe a bit unfamiliar. Meth, eth, pro, but you need to learn. But then from five onwards, pent, hex, hept, oct. You would have seen that when you were learning your shapes, um, you know, when you were young. So let's have a look here. So one carbon, methane, ethane, propane, butane, pentane, hexane, heptane, octane. The first part, meth, eth, pro, but, pent, etc. It's just telling us how many carbons there are in the molecule. The second part tells us the functional group. So the second part, the suffix, tells us which of all of our functional groups we have in that molecule. So here's a task I want you to do as we go through this. I want you to attempt to draw, uh, attempt to draw the displayed formula for each of the prop structures. So for each of our functional groups with three carbons, I want you to draw the displayed formula, which to remind you is where we show every bond in the molecule like that. I want you to draw, just, uh, draw the displayed formula for the prop for that functional group. What do I mean by that? Let me do the first one for you. So a simple alkane is all single bonds. So if we have a alkane, the suffix is ane. So if we have a three carbon alkane, three carbons for prop, that tells us it's three carbons, ends in ane, that tells us it's an alkane, we would call that propane. So this is what I mean where I want you to write the displayed formula and the name underneath it like this. So for my alkane, I'm gonna have my three carbons. The alkanes all have single bonds. Fill in everything else with the hydrogens because carbon always makes four bonds. This is going to be our prop, one, two, three carbons. It's an alkane, so it's propane. Our next one, our alkene, ends in ene. So if we have a three carbon alkene, that will be, yep, I'm sure you said it, <laughs> a propane. So we're gonna have a double bond because that's what makes it an alkene, that's the flavor of the molecule. Fill in all the hydrogens, making sure that we only have four on each carbon. It can be, uh, you know, you can sometimes get into the habit of just putting lines there. You just gotta make sure you've always got four for each carbon. Fill in the hydrogens, that is going to be called propene. Rightio, hopefully you've got the idea now as I introduce the next functional group, which is a alcohol. Alcohols have the suffix anil. So a three carbon alcohol will be propanol. So propane, propene, propanol. If we had a four carbon alcohol, it would be butanol. If we had an eight carbon alcohol, it would be octanol, but we don't, we've got a three carbon, so it is propanol. Radio, to save some time here, I'm gonna stop drawing in the hydrogens, but you need to keep drawing in the hydrogens. I'm just going to do it to save a little bit of time. So we've got our three carbons, we've got our hydroxyl group, that's what makes it the alcohol. Fill in the hydrogens, put H's all around them, and that is going to be called propanol. Now we're gonna look at later the fact that you can have these things called isomers where there's different, the same functional group on a different carbon. We're not worrying about that right now, if you already know what that is. We're just looking at simply to begin with. There's lots and lots to come, so don't stress. Aldehydes, a bit similar to a alcohol, only an aldehyde ends in an al. So if we got a three carbon aldehyde, we got propanol as opposed to propanol. So have a look at that one. Consider what the displayed formula might look like. Try to draw it. Bear in mind that carbon always has to have four bonds. Again, we're using that presumed knowledge to infer information. And what it would look like is something like this. So I've got my three carbons, H, H, H like that. But if I've only got a HO, 
like I've got here, that implies that we're going to have a double bond to the oxygen because otherwise we're not going to have all of our valences filled. So our aldehyde looks like that, and this would be propen out. So prop for the three carbons, an aldehyde looks like that at the end of the chain, that's a propen out. Like I keep saying, we're going to have lessons on each of these individually, so don't worry about learning these names straight away. You're going to use them so much that they will become second nature. Propanone. Similar to the propanol, only a different structural formula. Have a go at drawing that, and I will draw that now. So our propanone, we're gonna have our carbon, only this time we have the carbonyl group, the double bond O, in the chain. Oh look, I've drawn my hydrogens again. And we have propanone. Three more to go. Let's have a look at the next functional group. Pause and have a go at drawing it. This is a carboxylic acid. So it ends in a noic acid. That tells us it's a carboxylic acid. Three carbons, prop. We're gonna have propanoic acid. Pause and try to have a draw. And we end up with this molecule. So we're gonna have, how am I going for space? I'll do that over there a bit more. Three carbons, H, H, H like that. But then to have the functional group at the end here, the way that these can bonded, that, that, that these can bond so that carbon has four group, four bonds and the oxygen has two bonds, looks like this. We have a double bond O, OH, and we have propanoic acid. So it's a carboxylic acid with three carbons, prop for three carbons, and noic acid for a carboxylic acid. That is the molecule. Just gonna make some more space on the board here for the last two. Next one, amine, with three carbons, prop, and amine will end in ilamine. So this will be propylamine. See if you can have a draw of that and check it here now. So we've got our three carbons like that, and then our amine group is one of our nitrogen functional groups. Fill in all the hydrogens. I'm not drawing the hydrogens, but you're always drawing the hydrogens. Don't be lazy like me. Do as I say, not as I do. This is propyl amine, showing us that we've got the amine functional group, prop three carbons. And then our very last one, well not our very last one, but the last one we're gonna do is a nitrile, which ends in a nitrile. So this would be propen nitrile. Pause it, see if you can draw a displayed formula for that one, and then check it here. So three carbons, and then the only way we can satisfy the three bonds of the nitrogen and the four bonds of the carbon is to have that one like that. CH3, CH2, CN, propen nitrile. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Now, there are some that we need to be familiar with. Uh, note that halogenoalkanes and esters are not in the list, but we will look at these. And then this is by no means an exhaustive list of functional groups. Um, there's many more than this. These are just the main ones, the main players in the game, if you will, and the ones that we need to be familiar with. So, we can use the names to draw the molecules, but we can also use the uh, drawings of the molecules, or not the drawings, I shouldn't say, we should use our uh, formulas, the different types of formulas, to work out the names. So that's what we just did. We, we, we were given the name just then, and we drew a displayed formula. This time, what if we are given a formula, whether it's uh, displayed, whether it's structural or skeletal, and we had to name them? I want you to pause and see if using our prefixes and our suffixes, identify the number of carbons, identify the functional group that is present, pause, draw the following molecules, and see if you can name them. Pause it now, and I will put the answers up when you push play, which is hopefully now. <laughs> so we've got a three carbon alkane. We've got only carbon, carbon, single bonds, nothing else there. That's gonna be an alkane with three carbons. It's going to be propane. Then we've got a two carbon, so we know it's gonna be eth. And we have an aldehyde group, so it's going to be eth for now. Then we've got a one carbon, which is meth. And we've got an OH group, which is our alcohol, which is a null, so that's going to be methanol. 
our, our skeletal formula has the carbons at the vertices. So one, two, three, four, five carbons. So pent for five, it has a OOH group, carboxylic acid, which is a pentanoic acid. And then this one here, one, two, three carbons, it's gonna be prop something. And we've got a carbonyl group in the chain. That's gonna be a ketone. This will be propanone. So you can see that you can name given a um, drawing, given a skeletal, a displayed or a structural formula, or you can use the name to draw one of those three formulas. You can go back and forth, back and forth. Last thing to introduce today is this um, molecule called benzene. Benzene is a bit of a unique molecule and it's not one we look at with a lot of depth in this course, we'll look at a lot more next year, but we just need to be familiar with identifying it. And it's got this, what's called an aromatic structure, which is a resonance structure where we've got conjugating double bonds. You notice here we've got a single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond, and it's in a ring. So it's a cyclic structure. Now, benzene is a unique molecule. So far, we've just been discussing straight chain alkyl groups where we remove a hydrogen from an alkane chain to add the functional group. So we're removing one of the hydrogens or two of the hydrogens to add our functional group here. We've also got these things called aryl groups, which are molecules that contain at least one benzene molecule. So the reason why benzene is such a unique structure is because the double bonds and the single bonds aren't localized, they're delocalized, they can move around. So if I draw a skeletal formula of benzene, these double bonds can move around the ring and it can exist in two resonance structures where the double bonds, I mean, they're not really in either of these positions, rather they're constantly moving uh, between them. These are kind of two extremes of the spectrum, but the electrons are constantly moving around like this. So we can, we can sort of summarize this resonance by just doing a circle in the middle there. Because in actuality, neither of these are true single or true double bonds. This resonance sort of makes them 1.5 bonds. Um, so we can draw it like that to show the fact that these electrons are delocalized and this resonance structure can move around the ring. And we can represent that like that. At this point, we just need to be familiar with that diagram and what it means. So that diagram means this molecule here, and we need to identify that as a benzene molecule. We look at benzene and aryl groups a lot more next year. Okay, we also have branch chains. So we've been looking just at straight chains. We can also have uh, carbon skeletal groups that come off a main chain and we need to be familiar with how to name those as well. So you can see here that we've got a number of carbons, but it's not all in a straight chain, which is what we've been looking at so far. So what you've got to do to name your branch change, six uh, straightforward steps. You've got to locate the longest carbon chain in your compound. Now you've got to be careful here because it might not even, or it might not always be the most uh, obvious carbon chain. What do I mean by that? This one here, we've got one, two, three, four, five carbons. We've got one, two, three, four, five carbons. So no matter way, which way you are, uh, write this, you're gonna have five carbons as your longest carbon chain, which is your parent chain. But if we look at this one here, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six that way, whereas we've got one, two, three, four, five, six that way. So that's the same as well. Let me come up with an example here of what I mean by this. If I was to draw a skeletal formula like this, you wanna find the longest carbon chain for the parent chain. So this one has one, two, three, four that way. But if we go this way, one, two, three, four, five, six, this is actually your parent chain. So you wanna find the longest chain in the molecule. That will be the parent chain. Uh, so if we've got five, five carbons here, that's going to be a pent as, a, um, as the start of the molecule. Then you wanna figure out the ending, what functional group it is. These are all alkanes, so this will be some sort of pentane. Then you've gotta number your carbon atoms. So if I draw this molecule here as a displayed formula, 
So I've got, I'll do it as a skeletal formula. Actually one, two, three, four, five. And then we have a carbon chain coming up there. So this is CH3, CH, CH2, CH2, CH3, and then a CH3 like that. So I've just put it up, but this is the same one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, same molecule here. So you want to name, you want to number it. So we got one, two, three, four, five. Same thing here, one, two, three, four, five. Then you've got to name the side chain and you put the side chain with the same rules, only instead of just being meth, you add YL to the end. So it'll be a methyl, an ethyl, a propyl, a butyl. It will be, depending how many carbons, this will be the side chain. So our molecule here, we have a pent, so it's some sort of pentane, because that's what we've got as the parent chain. But we've got a one carbon coming off, so we've got a methyl group coming off. So it's some sort of methyl pentane. Then we've just got to say what number the carbon is on. So this is on carbon two, so this is a two methyl pentane. Now this would be different to if we had the side chain coming off of this one. That would be a three methyl pentane. But it wouldn't be different to if we had that one there. 4-methyl pentane is the same as 2-methyl pentane because you always count to make the numbers as low as possible. So if we count the other way, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, always count to make the numbers as low as possible. That's one of our rules. So we've got a 2-methyl pentane there. I'll do the next one for you and then you can have a go at naming these yourself. You gotta find the longest chain. We got one, two, three, four, five, six that way. One, two, three, four, only five that way. One, two, three, four, five, six. So six is our longest chain. So it's some sort of a hexane because it's all carbon, carbon, single bonds. There's no other functional groups. Off of the one, two, third carbon, we have two carbon branch. A two carbon branch is an ethyl. So we're going to have a three ethyl hexane. It wouldn't be a one, two, three, four ethyl hexane because you always want to make that number as low as possible. So you want it to be one, two, three ethyl hexane. Pause, see if you can work out the last two here and then see if you can have a go at drawing our canes from the names. So again, doing it the opposite way. If you're given the name, can you draw a displayed formula for these? Pause, see if you can work out these two and draw those three and we can check the answer after you've done it. So find the parent chain, one, two, three, four, no matter which way, one, two, three, four, no matter which way you count, a butane is the longest parent chain. Then we've got a one carbon chain there and a one carbon chain there. So we've got a methyl group, but we've got two of them. So we've got a dimethyl coming off of carbons one, two, three, four. So two, three, dimethyl butane. The good thing is that these names are consistent no matter which way you name it from, you're always gonna end up with the same thing. So let's say if we had this as the parent chain, one, two, three, four, we would still have a methyl off of carbon number two and a methyl off of carbon number three. So no, no matter which way you look at it, it's two, three, dimethyl butane. This one, a bit trickier again. Our longest carbon chain is a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, a heptane. We've got three methyls. So a trimethyl off of carbon three and carbon five, Two of them are coming off of carbon three, one of them is coming off of carbon five. So it's a 3-3 three, three, tri, three, three, five trimethyl heptane. What about drawing it from the names given? So with these ones, you sort of got to work backwards a little bit. You've got to see what the parent chain is. Oh, and just make sure that you know exactly what kind of formula it's asking us to do a displayed formula. So make sure we are drawing a displayed formula. So we've got a propane parent chain, one, two, three carbons. We've got a methyl off of carbon two. So we've got a two methyl propane, and then we just fill in all of our hydrogens to get our molecule like that, not forgetting our hydrogens off of the branched chain. Same thing here. If you didn't quite get that, maybe pause now and see if you can work it out, um, working backwards from the parent stem. So pentane, pent means five. Ane, it's all single bonds because it's an alkane. We've got two methyls, a dimethyl off of carbon two and carbon three. 
carbon two and carbon three. So this is gonna be two, three dimethyl pentane, fill in all of the hydrogens. Uh, oh, I gotta do my carbons, two, three dimethyl. As you can see, a skeletal formula might be a easier thing to draw here. This is the idea that sometimes doing a displayed formula isn't the most time efficient way to do it, but it does show every single bond, um, albeit quite messily when I do it. So let's just make sure we got this right. We got a pentane, one, two, three, four, five. We got two methyl groups of carbon number two and carbon number three, and we filled in all our hydrogens. Our final one, 3-ethyl, 2,4-dimethyl hexane. So our parent is a hexane. That's six carbons. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. We have two methyl groups, dimethyl off of carbons two and carbons four. So one, two, we've got a methyl group there. One, uh, oh, well now I haven't done a displayed formula here. So just make sure that you're doing what it asks you to do. And we've got a methyl off of carbon four, which would be there as well. And then off of carbon three, we have an ethyl. So we've got dimethyl hexane, one, two, three, four, five, six for the hexane, two methyls for carbon two and four, and an ethyl, which is two carbons off of carbon number three. Fill in all your hydrogens. I will be lazy and skip this one here, but make sure that they've all got hydrogens like that. So you can see it's kind of, it's, I like to think of it a little bit as a game. You know, there's certain rules and it's kind of like a bit of a quiz, you, a bit of a trivia or a mind teaser or something. You've got to work out the structure based on the name. I quite find it quite an amusing thing to do. <laughs> but it's all just based on rules. We learn the rules, we're on the bike, we are laughing. And with that mammoth lesson, we have finished our first look into organic chemistry. What have we done? We've interpreted and used the general structural displayed and skeletal formulae of the following classes of compounds. Alkanes, alkenes, halogenoalkanes, alcohols, aldehydes, ketones, carboxylic acids, esters, amines, nitriles. Understand and use system, uh, systematic nomenclature of simple aliphatic organic molecules with functional groups uh, detailed there. Up to six carbons, so up to our hex. Six plus six for esters, amides, straight chains only. Deduce the possible isomers for an organic molecule of a known molecular formula. We'll look at isomers a lot more in the next lesson. Deduce the molecular formula of a compound given its structural displayed or skeletal formula. Your task for this lesson, pause, work through those and you will consolidate your understanding. Excellent, thanks for your time for our first initial look into organic chemistry. Huge amount of information to introduce, but we've got to start somewhere. We've got to introduce all our rules, but like I said, we're gonna be having lessons on each of the individual functional groups. Um, we're gonna spend a lot more time looking at our introduction to organic chemistry in the next couple of lessons. So there'll be plenty of time to consolidate and become comfortable with the organic chem. Thank you very much. See you on the next one.